Getting started in Baldur's Gate 3 can be riddled with a certain level of analysis paralysis when it comes to choosing which class and subsequent subclass you're going to play for your first playthrough. Well, in this video, I want to propose one of my favorite characters for beginners that does incredible melee damage, can access most everything in the game skill-wise, and can finesse their way through any and all conversations. You'll even have access to spells and devastating paladin smites. That build is the Bardadin. Now, if this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. So to make this build, we would take two levels of Paladin. You can go with any Paladin Oath, really, but we'll be using the Oath of Vengeance as that will deliver a flat radiant damage increase as well as daze our target. Then you'll take 10 levels into Bard and focus on the College of Swords. This will enable you to use your Bardic Inspirations for flourishes that will deal tons of damage, give you some free AC bonuses, or even help with some AoE capabilities. Truly, this build can really be built in any way you want. Dual wield, sword and board, two-handed, dex-based, strength-based, whatever you want, you can get it out of this Bardadin. And that's really the uh, too long didn't watch of this entire video. Now that's all you wanted to know, then please feel free to shut the video down and get cracking on making your Bardy Paladin bro in BG3. Before you head out though, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Each one of those things does help me out in a huge way. I've gone from something like, I don't know, 89% to now 80% unsubscribed viewership because of your help, but that's a number I'm still trying to change a little bit here. So every little bit helps. You can jump ahead to any part of this video that interests you the most by using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And if you need help with any other subject in Baldur's Gate 3, check out my playlist linked below at the end of the video in the upper right hand corner. It's just all over the place. But let's get started here on the best starter build in Baldur's Gate 3. Loading into character creation, you can really go with any race. And if you're brand new to the game, um, there are no benefits stat wise or as far as ability points go for choosing any race over the other it's all about these race features you're going to see at the bottom and certain race features that are going to progress as the character levels up so with that being said i actually very much enjoy both the um asmodeus tiefling and the mephistopheles tiefling and that's mainly because of the fact that they benefit from three sets of cantrips. Asmodeus is going to get Produce Flame and then Hellish Rebuke, which is going to be a reactive spell. So if they take damage, they can go ahead and splash um, fire damage back at their target, which I really like. And also Darkness. All three of those can be pretty handy in the right situations. Mephistopheles Tiefling is going to get Mage Hand, which can do a lot of fun things like access certain stuff or maybe pull a quest item off of a shelf for you, whatever it is. But they also get Burning Hands, which is going to be useful since you will be in close combat, and Flame Blade. Now, Flame Blade is a level 5 spell. Or I'm sorry, you get access to it at level 5. And it's not amazing, but in the early portions of the game, it's a nice way to kind of convert your damage wholly over to fire, and it's a cool way to kind of give you this awesome flaming weapon as a paladin. Zariel Tiefling, I personally wouldn't choose, even though I like them lore-wise, but the fact that they get Searing Smite and Branding Smite, two spells that I get access to as a paladin, and they cost me both an action and a bonus action to use, and even concentration, I'll just steer clear of those and choose maybe some of the utility from these two. Some other really good standout races is just simply the human, because they get an increase to their carry capacity, and also they can choose an extra skill of their choice, which is very nice. I will always choose the Drow, because it's one of my favorite races in the entire world. World? Faerun? Whatever. And um, I think it's also kind of a really fun thematic one to have a Drow Paladin, in my, in my mind. Half-Elf is really fun. Um, I would probably go to a Wood Half-Elf, just to get the increase to my Fleet of Foot or uh, go with that um, increased fleet of foot is increase your movement speed, by the way. <laughs> Forgot about that part. Uh, drow, just to, again, go with a half drow rather than a full drow. Half orc is a really good one here because we are going with melee weapons. So savage attacks, when you land a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, you deal an extra dice of weapon damage. That's going to kick in here. And also to kind of lean into the fact that you are a paladin being in the front line, relentless endurance, if you reach zero hit points, you regain one hit point instead of becoming downed. So it gives you a little bit more durability. And in that same breath of being durable, the gold dwarf here gives you an extra point of hit points every level, which is awesome. Shield dwarf, no benefit here because we're going to get all the all of this comes with just simply being a paladin but the dwegar is very good um, the dwegar is an interesting dwarf here in that it will give us access to all the things that we get as a dwarf which means that we get resistance and advantage on saving throws to poison but the dwegar have a little bit of an extra uh, ditty here they'll have an advantage on saving throws against illusions and being charmed or paralyzed and 
they get an ability to enlarge themselves at level three and they get invisibility at level five. So you get a lot of really cool stuff from the Dwegar. It's, I think it's a race that a lot of people kind of um, don't go with, but it is a really, really cool one. Dragonborn is something I always really love for Paladins. In tabletop, Dragonborn Vengeance Paladin is what I want to make. So I will always give you uh, this as a good option. Just go with an element that makes sense for you. And lastly, if this is your first playthrough of the game, without spoiling anything. Uh, going with a Gith is, I think, not one that, as far as Larian statistics go, it's the least chosen race. But I think it's the race that offers you a ton, a ton of really cool, unique narrative options that you get with no other race because the Gith play a very huge role in the story. And this action right here is very good. Astral Knowledge gained proficiency, so at the base level, plus two, in all skills of a chosen ability. Meaning if I chose... Um, wisdom, for example, then all of the abilities, I'm sorry, skills that do wisdom, like animal handling, insight, medicine, perception, survival, all of them will get my proficiency bonus into them as if I've put points into that skill. So it's a really, really good capability. And on top of it, they get uh, a special mage hand. Well, not a special mage hand, they just get a mage hand. Um, they get certain items that'll increase that an enhanced leap and a misty step at one, three, and five. All really great abilities, especially for a melee character like a paladin. Going into our class, of course, we're gonna be choosing paladin, which will give us our lay on hands, which won't ever really get stronger because we're only gonna put two levels into this, and divine sense, which gives you advantage on attack rolls against celestials, fiends, and undead. It's not gonna play a huge part in the beginning of the game, but it will play a huge part in the middle and the very late portions of the game. So this is a nice thing just to have. Also, we'll have our Oath. So our Oath is going to be Inquisitor's Might. You or an ally's weapon attacks deal an additional two radiant damage and can daze enemies for one turn. This was for two turns. Hmm, maybe it's... Oh, oh yeah. There we go. You can daze the enemy for one turn, but this lasts for two turns. <laughs> so um, the damage here, though, is based off of our Charisma modifier, and that's important because Oath of Devotion is a static one to four radiant damage if you get hit. An Oath of Ancients is a healing based off of your Paladin level plus a, some other circumstances. Oath of Vengeance scales nicely with the stats that we are gonna focus on as a Bardadin, so it was really nice. And on top of it, we have the Tenet here that is a little bit more flexible. Fight the greater evil, exerting your wisdom, identify the higher morality in any given instance, and fight for it. They're very much a ends justify the means type of Paladin versus the Oath of Devotion is the lawful good, very I will do no wrong paladin. So this isn't, this is more of like a, maybe a lawful neutral. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a D and D player. I, I wouldn't know how to really give you a scale of this, but it's, it's a little bit more flexible. I'll say than the oath of devotion, maybe even the oath of ancients or no mercy for the wicked chasten those who dole out their villainy by wiping their blight from the world forever. So you've got that as your, uh, your go-to. Now, for your background, please choose a background that goes for you and the role play you have for your character. This is a single player narrative game. So have fun with it. There's no reason to really min max every little thing in this. Have fun with creating a little background for your character before you jump into the very first time you're going to play. Are you, uh, I've said this one all the time, but a noble son that has, that has joined a paladin order? Are you a former entertainer who has found their way into a paladin order through some happenstance? Maybe they were talking to someone in the crowd and it led to going into a paladin order. Are you a former soldier who has taken an oath are you um an acolyte again who has taken that same oath and has jumped into a paladin order whatever it is choose the one that makes sense for you the entertainer would be really, really cool right if we're going with a, a bardadin or a charlatan into a bardadin a lot of cool stuff that you can go with my min max choice though for if i if you just don't really want to choose this you just kind of want to choose one is the guild artisan because it gives us skill insight and persuasion two really important skills that you will use throughout the entirety of the campaign and they're going to help you out especially in conversation now as we go into our skills you can choose whatever you wish um, if we have persuasion already chosen, I think that's a pretty good one to go with. I like having insight or perception. Uh, both of these are very, very good. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll take intimidation here. Um, religion is fun. It's just, I'd say religion, nature, and yeah, I'd say religion, nature, history, and arcana. You're just going to have the, the occasional role here and there, and it's more flavor than it is actually like going to be campaign relevant. But athletics is also good to be able to either resist someone shoving you or you shoving someone to push them off of something or whatever it is. But let's now talk about our abilities. So your abilities are going to depend upon the type of character you want to play as. 
Do you want to focus on finesse weapons and really try to use only finesse weapons? Well then, you're going to want to put your dexterity here up to 16. That's probably what you're going to want to do. Or do you want to just simply go sort like nice sword and board or two-handed weapon style, kind of focusing on the typical paladin? You're going to want to bring your strength then up to 16. Now, I'm assuming you're going to go with heavy armor, which means that we're probably going to keep our dexterity at 10, if not 12. That way we can just get plus one to our initiative. But heavy armor is going to negate the AC bonus we would get from dexterity otherwise. So I would probably sit, sit either at 10 or 12 there, maybe even putting my wisdom to 10 so that I don't have any um, negative modifiers or penalties as, for, what, for what it's worth when I'm rolling against any kind of uh, controlling effects. Now, charisma is either going to be 16 or 17, depending upon how you're maybe playing the game. If you really want to min-max this down to the absolute, complete, ultimate point, then maybe, you know, put the plus one there and do that. Or the plus two on your charisma and plus one up to strength. There you go. That, now you've got 17. You can get this from the hag's hair and all sorts of other things if you've already played the game. Or if you're on honor mode and you don't want to rely on those kinds of things, just bring it down to 16 and you're good to go. You're fine with this kind of setup. Nothing is going to go wrong with the 16 over 17 charisma. The big thing is, of course, remember, every two points over 10, you get a plus one to your ability modifier. If you have 17 in charisma, you're setting yourself up down the road for some sort of benefit that you know is coming in the game because you've maybe played it before or whatever it is. So just wanted to be transparent about that. So if you don't know if you don't know what's coming, then just stick with this. It's a safe way to go about it. But if, for those going through their millionth playthrough, you know what to do. So here's our stats. Let's now jump into progression for this character. Switching over to my higher level character, I'm going to respec him and we're going to go through the progression of this build. So starting off into level two, we're going to stay as a paladin and we're going to get Divine Smite. And this is going to give be a major source of damage for us throughout the entirety of this build, which we'll go into after we go through the progression. But you can start with just a bard at this point, but I think this is the most straightforward if you're brand new to the game. Now for your fighting style, you're going to choose either defense, great weapon fighting, dueling, or protection. If you want to go with sword and board, like just kind of being a sword and shield character that's defensive, go with protection for to for your reaction, or just go with dueling to do more damage with a weapon that you're holding in one hand. Uh, if you have a shield in the other hand, it's not a weapon, so it's fine. You can have a, a sword and a shield, and you'll still get the plus two damage here. Defense is just a nice come all if you want to try any weapon style that kind of comes your way. It just adds plus one to your armor class while wearing armor. It's easy. I'm going to go great weapon fighting. If you want to dual wield, you would do that when you choose your bard. But you would do this port. If you do that, I would say choose defense right now and then switch over to. Uh, you, you'll get two weapon fighting when you go bard. But we'll go great weapon fighting now. And then for your spells, um, just choose whatever makes sense for you. As this paladin, we will already have certain spells. So let's go ahead and go with heroism. Let's go with shield of faith, I guess. Um, command is really nice. Bless is really nice if you don't have one that can already do it. Like if you don't have like Shadow Heart in your party or whatever. No other cleric or something like that. Uh, protection from evil and good is very good. Uh, that Searing Smite is right here like I talked about. The action, bonus action, and concentration. That's quite a lot of investment. Um, Divine Favor is your weapon attack steal an additional 1 to 4 radiant damage. This can be a kind of cool one. Just keep in mind, anytime it says concentration, you can only have one concentration spell up at a, at a time. And your charisma, or your constitution modifier, will go towards rolling this if you get hit. So if you get hit, your character has to make a concentration check, which is a constitution check. If you have a high constitution, it helps to push this through. So... Uh, let's go with this one because this gives us access to just thunder damage and it's kind of cool, right? Who, who knows? Um, just choose these more off of your party, not what I'm saying because your party might say, hey, you know, I already got a character who can do bless, so I'm going to remove that and put that here. Whatever kind of makes sense for you. You know what, actually? I'm going to remove Shield of Faith and do Psychic 1. Wrathful Smite is pretty fun. So we'll accept that and we'll jump into level 3, but we will not be Paladin. We will now go to Bard. And with Bard, we will choose a bunch of stuff. So cantrips, I'm going to go with Vicious Mockery and Blade Ward. If you don't have a character that can do it, definitely get one that's got... Uh, I'd swap one of these off for friends. Probably Vicious Mockery, to be honest. Now for your spells, anytime you see these little boxes around the spell, it's a spell you have from another class. So we're going to skip those two. But getting Longstrider is really good because it's a ritual spell, meaning that it does not 
cost you a spell point to cast it. Same thing here with Speak with Animals. So you cast these two spells on yourself or all your characters, like Longstrider, and everyone can now move 10 feet faster until long rest, doesn't cost concentration, anything like that. It's a very good capability. Vicious, or Tasha's Hideous Laughter is a really good way to CC things, just knock them prone. Um, I very much like Thunder Wave to just push things back and do quite a bit of damage. Uh, other really good ones are Dissonant Whispers. Fairy Fire can be good. Uh, bonus Action Heal with Healing Word is also great as well. Starting Instrument, go with whatever one you'd like. And for abilities, we will get a new skill proficiency. So we'll go with... You know, I'll go Performance because I'm going to go into a Bard. We'll accept that. So we'll go to level 2. We'll choose a new spell. And we'll just go Dissonant Whispers, whatever. Sleep is really good at the very beginning of the game and then falls off very quickly. So I would not recommend it for a long-term playthrough. Also, no, you're going to get access to Jack of All Trades. So your vast experience makes you more likely to succeed in any undertaking. Add half your proficiency bonus, which is either 2, 3, or 4, depending on when you are at link, where you're at in the game. Rounded down to ability checks you are not proficient in. So this just helps you out with everything throughout the game when it comes to rolling stuff. That you're like, ah, I didn't put any proficiency in that. Well, you get this at least now. Also, you get Song of Rest, meaning you now get an additional short rest. So you have two short rests in the game by default. This is the same action as a short rest, and it is going to take a long rest to replenish it. So it's a great utility to add into the party. Jumping into level 3 bar, we choose our college. So we're going to go with the College of Swords. Now, this is going to give us access to some flourishes. These flourishes you can use as either melee or range, whichever you wish. You can see there's there's only three, and there's, so there's six here, right? There's one for each. So, fla slashing flourish melee, attack up to two enemies at once, once, attack defensively, increasing your armor class by four if you hit, and thrust your weapon with enough force to push your target back 20 feet. Afterwards, you can teleport to the target. And you can layer this in with your smites to do a ton of damage. It's really, really cool, right? Because you're adding 1d6 slashing to whatever you're doing with these things. So it's a really cool capability to add just a lot of fun flavor here. But now we have our level, level 2 spells. So you can do some really good ones here like uh, Blindness is amazing. Clo Cloud of Daggers for just some damage. Um, enhance ability is nice just to, if you want to use it for conversational portions. Heat metal is a really cool way to have, have someone drop a weapon. Hold person is very, very strong. Um, shatter is a really good range spell that you can use. Silence is great to have if you don't already have it in the party. Whatever makes sense. Keep in mind, though, this is a concentration ability. Um, so if you go into combat, combat with this, just don't get, don't, don't get it knocked off you, is what I'm trying to say. In fact, I'll go with blindness. And fighting style, this is when we would go with two-weapon fighting, if you wanted to go with it. Um, if not, you could go with dueling here and, and stick with protection on your other character if you wanted to go with like maybe a sword and shield. This would be a really cool way to go about that. So I'll just click two-weapon fighting, assuming that's what you wanted to do, if you wanted to do um, dual wheel. Now to level four, we'll choose some cantrips. We'll go friends, which we didn't pick up earlier. And spells, we'll choose... You know, hypnotic patterns, or I'm sorry, that's a hypnotic pattern, damn. And Thrall's actually not bad, though. Reduce a uh, creature's peripheral vision and make it look at you, if you want it to kind of focus. Um, we'll go with yeah, go with a uh, hold person. But now we have to talk about feats. And you have a lot of options here for feats. You can go with heavily armored to just make your, I'm sorry, heavy armor master to make yourself even more durable if you want to go with more of a tanking route. If you want to stick with dual wielding, go with dual wielder, because now you get plus one bonus to armor class while wielding a melee weapon in each hand, and you can dual you can dual wield weapons that you can dual wield all weapons that aren't light. Now it says you can use two weapon fighting even if your weapons aren't light, which is very very good. If if you're going dual wielding, you need this ability. But some other good ones here are lucky, just to give you a luck points here, which you can reroll attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws is really good. Um, if you want to go with pole arms, you can go with something like Polearm Master, which you would then couple with Sentinel, making it so opportunity attacks are super devastating. And the cool thing about Polearm Master is you get this bonus attack uh, that you attack with the, bun uh, the, the butt of your weapon. You can actually use Smite with this. That's a really cool way to kind of add Smite even more damage into things. That's a ton of fun. Mage Slayer, where things will get a disadvantage on concentration saving throws against you, and you have an advantage on any saving throws against it. So a lot of our, uh, spells that are cast within melee range, which is really, really cool. Um, there's a lot of really good ones in this in this whole entire scenario. But for this character, or if you want to go with a, more of a tanky shield character, get Shield Master too. That's help, it's helpful for spells, because you can basically use your shield against them for dexterity saving throws. 
Um, and also, of course, stuff just like alert plus five bonus to initiative and can't be surprised. It's always just really nice. Um, what I'm going to do for this character is actor plus one to charisma. So that brings my 17 charisma out of 18. And your charisma, your proficiency bonus is also doubled for deception and performance checks. And why I like that is that it allows me to really push through those checks of deception and performance if I need to. I would take that probably second. The first one I'm going to take for this character in specific, because I've set myself up like this, is... Uh, oh, it's up here. Great Weapon Master, because we're using two-handed weapons. When you land a crit hit or kill a target with a melee attack weapon, you can make another melee attack weapon attack as a bonus action that turn. That's huge. And all of your melee weapon attacks that you are proficient with, which is kind of crazy, right? Uh, are wielding in both hands and can deal... Blah, 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 blah. Sorry. Attacks with melee weapons you're proficient with and are wielding in both hands. Any two-handed weapon is what I meant. Jesus. <laughs> you can deal an additional 10 damage at the cost of a minus 5 to attack roll. So you can toggle this on or off. So it's nice if you're like, hey, you know what? I'm just killing some chaff units or some just kind of bullshit. This is nice to get that damage. Hey, I got to turn this off so I can really alpha strike uh, a boss who already has a really hard chance to hit. So it's a nice way to kind of push through that stuff. And as always, too, there's always just standard ability improvement. But we're going to start with Great Weapon Master and then get Actor after that. Furthering our progression, we're just going to put five more levels into Bard. At level five here, we get Improvement Bardic Inspiration, which is going to give us a 1d8 on Bardic Inspiration versus 1d6. And Font of Inspiration. So now we'll regain all of our Bardic Inspirations on a short rest, not just a long rest. So we'll do it on both, which is cool. Um, for our level three capabilities, we now have access to Glyph of Warding, which is just so strong. Uh, plant growth is good for slowing things down to CC them. Uh, fearing them is always really, really good. Um, hypnotic Pattern is also a very good CC as well. But I'm going to go with Glyph of Warding. It's just very good overall. Into level 6, we're just going to keep pushing. But level 6, we do get Counter Charm. Your allies within 30 feet have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened, which is cool. And now we get extra attack. So if your other melee characters have already gotten this, you're probably noticing, man, I kind of feel a little bit weak. You will now turn on quote unquote as it were and be able to do a ton more damage conversely you could have done six bard first then two paladin but again i like having those smites uh open to me because i just do a shit ton of damage with them uh we'll go with something like i just really like fear it's a really good ability we'll go fear into level seven another spell now we have our level four spells and in this case freedom of movement is a really good one here snap an ally out of any Stun. Difficult terrain can slow the cancel them down and they can't be magically paralyzed or restrained. You can cast this on yourself if you want. It's just a really good capability. Um, the other ones here are okay. Confusion, I mean, as far as this character goes, but I'd probably go with this one. Um, I've got Misty Step on this character, but I don't know why. Um, Dimension Door is also pretty cool too. You can teleport yourself and an adjacent ally to any place that you see. This allows for a lot of mobility. Um, it just is an action versus Misty Step, which is a um, bonus action. Into level 8, we will get more spells and a new feat. So I'm going to go ahead and take that actor feat I talked about. And Oh, did it not go up? No, it did. We need to take our spell. And you know what? Confusion's actually pretty good. Confuse a group of creatures, causing them to attack at random, wander around aimlessly, and occasionally skip turns into a stupor. Um, is a fun one. We'll just go with that. Level 9. And we're going to get we got one more level that's really going to allow us to pop off here. So hold monsters cool. Plan our binding is really cool. Um, dominate person is very fun. Having a really cool here like mass cure wounds is a really fun one as well. Um, I just really think that this is going to depend upon your build at this point for the rest of the party. Who who's doing what and what can you supplement them with? Um, dominate person make a humanoid fight alongside you. Every time the creature takes damage, it makes a wisdom saving throw against your domination. Allies cannot be dominated. So. It's, um, you can do that, or you can use Planner Binding to just completely strip the ownership of any of the uh, Celestial, Elemental, Fey, or Fiends in the game, which you're going to deal with quite a bit of in, this, in the latter act. It's a cool way to just kind of, alright, that person's on my team now, which is just a kind of a cool capability. And Hold Monster works just like Hold Person, but for a monster. In fact, you know what, we'll just go with Hold Monster. And lastly, at level 10 Bard, we get all of the cool stuff. So for one, we're going to get now more skill proficiencies. So we can go ahead now and go into Intimidation if we want. We can go into Perception now. Uh, insight. In fact, that's what I'm probably going to do there. And we'll stick with that and, and, and hang out there. Um, but, actually, it's... 
I think actually we get uh, expertise. Yeah, now we get expertise, which you add your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check that uses either of your chosen proficiencies. So we're adding even more um, proficiency into this. If you're using intimidation a lot, go with that. Whatever kind of makes sense for your character, as always, guys. And, you know, I'll go Mage Hand here. doesn't really matter. And can't another spell. I'll go with a Mask Cure Wounds just to have another healing. But this is the big reason we went to 10 Bard. Because now we get Magical Secrets. Which is basically spells from across every... Not every single spellcaster, but majority of the spellcasters. And one of the strongest ones in this entire list is Spirit Guardians. Nearby enemies take 3 to 24 Radiant Damage or Necrotic Damage per turn. And their movement speed is halved. You can increase this, because it's a level 3 spell slot, you can increase it with higher spell slots. So you can, boom, go all the way up to that. Since we have level 5 spell slots, you can do that. You can get Conjure Elemental to have uh, bros fight alongside you. You can go Banishment to just completely remove something from the game for two turns before it comes back online. You have so many spells in here. Warden of Vitality is probably one of the strongest heals in the game. You can get... Counterspell, if you don't have a character that already has Counterspell. You can go with Haste, if you want to just basically have Potion of Speed on a uh, cool, on, on cooldown, but on an actual spell. Hunger of Hadar. Vampiric Touch is really cool. Touch an enemy to siphon their life force and regain half as many hit points. For 10 turns, you can use Vampiric Touch again without expending an additional spell slot. So basically, you just have this... this Ability that you can use to just constantly siphon health from people if you want and do damage to them. Misty Step for some mobility. There's a lot of really good options here. I'll go Warden of Vitality to add some healing into this group. But if I wanted just to really add maybe even Crusader Mantle, you can't remember, this says Concentration. So I cannot stack Concentration capabilities. So just kind of keep those things in mind. Um, Warden of Vitality, though, is not a Concentration ability. It's why I really like it. You could even go with Grant Flight which is, again, concentration ability, uh, to give you some mobility to get right up in the cookie jar of someone. So have some fun with this. Choose the things that make sense for your build and your character as, as you've gone up to this point and, and really kind of supplement into your entire party. That's what's really going to matter. And also, too, keep in mind, every level you have this, this, time, this chance to replace a spell. As a bard, you cannot pick and choose your spells from your spell book like you can with any of, like say, your divine casters, like your cleric, your paladin, your druid, uh, or even your wizard you have to replace them with this capability. So just keep that in mind. You'd press it and you do like one at a time. And you go, okay, well, you know what? Now I'll put this back in. I'll put, I'll, I'll take that, whatever it is. We're not gonna do that, but still, you understand what I mean. So that is the progression of this character. Let's talk about all of it put together. So with the Barded and everything online, we have a ton of abilities. And honestly, if you kind of just play the game as is, it's, it's a lot. This is a very messy bar. So there's this little padlock right here. Click it to unlock it. And what I would tell you to do is maybe move your flourishes. Maybe keep your range ones. Oopsies, don't do that. Move you over here for the sake of this video so I can maybe make this a little bit neater. Maybe, okay, we'll put our melee ones in a line here. Okay, now I know all my melee ones. We'll keep our range ones down here. So now all the stuff that's like martial for the intents and purposes of me like casting spells and not casting spells, it's over here. You can do this even further and say, hey, you know what? Let's take our Paladin abilities and put those right here as well. So what I'm trying to do is I want to encourage you to not just take the, the UI as the, as the default thing kind of gives you. I would tell you to really try and customize this out and say, hey, you know what? Let me put all my smites in one location, all my, uh, my ritual spells in one location. Okay, let's do my, my defensive ones here. And you can tell by the little, it's kind of usually indicated by the color, right? Uh, let's take my offensive spells and put them in a line down here. With a warding, we'll put this guy up here. Just basically what I'm trying to tell you is, this is a very messy character UI wise. And I think it really is on you to put the right things in the right spots. So you're not kind of tripping over yourself Trying to figure out, oh, where's that ability I needed? Oh god, where is it? This allows you to kind of keep things a little bit neater on yourself. So you know, like, okay, I got... My psychic spells are all right here, or this is right there, whatever it is. And we'll do, like... thing down here, there. So this is an example of what I mean. Now I can see, oh, hey, you know what? I got to cast a defensive spell. It's probably in this line right here. 
Hey, I gotta CC something. It's probably right here. I have a, I mean, one of my ritual spells. They're right here. What are my smites? They're right there. Heal. Boom. Um, let me do one of my offensive capabilities. Well, they're all probably right down here. So that's what I mean. Like try and probably CC goes up there, right? Um, try and kind of organize this a way that kind of fits a little bit better for you, how you want to approach this character. Hey, you know what? I want to do um, any one of my smite or any one of my special flourishes. Well, they're all right here. So with all those things said, we put this together into a character that is extremely strong. We can use our lay on hand charges to get some healing. It's only eight healing. It's nothing crazy. I wouldn't even really kind of write home about it. But our Inquisitor's Might has scaled with us because we are ha we have plus four to our charisma. So this will now be active for us for two turns, plus four radiant damage on whatever we're doing. And that's important because our smites are stupid strong. Here's just a level one spell slot smite. It's 10 to 24 damage, 10 to 34 damage. You know what? I'm not even using the right weapon. Here, let's put the right weapon in. I don't think it really matters, but we're gonna do it other way. Okay, 23 to 47. Here we go. I don't know why I said it didn't matter. I'm dumb. And then this is how this scales up to 24 to 55. Let's go all the way to level six to 26 to 71 damage coming out of this bad boy. And you can make it by clicking any one of these buttons to go to your reaction screen. You can go over here to your divine smites and you can trigger them to work so that, hey, you know what? Your, uh, this will, the weapon will deal an additional two to 16 damage increase by one to 18 when attacking fiends are undead, blah, 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 blah. This weapon won't trigger on a critical hit. You basically can turn it so this work on a critical hit on a hit you can just turn these little itty bitties on so you aren't always having to use the ability you can say hey i actually landed my hit the game will then ask you did you want to divine smite that and you can say yes or no so you can have fun with this and use these reactions to basically oh i, for I totally forgot to divine smite right there well the game's got you bro did you want me to do that for you sure do go ahead and supersize me and smash him in the face with the divine smite and Divine Smite is just such a strong capability because it's going to... We've got so many instances of it. In this exact scenario, right? We've got 9, 10, 12, 16 total Divine Smites if we didn't use a single one of our spells. And that's a really cool capability. And we also have our Bardic Inspiration. So we can see here Defensive Flourish is going to do 22 to 41 damage and then add 4 AC to me. Or I'm going to push someone back and then teleport to them and do 22 to 41. Or this, I'm going to do 22 to 37 to two enemies at once. So you can see that there's a lot of fun to be had with this build. You also have Song of Rest to do a short rest. You have your Divine Sense for advantage on attack rolls here. We have our Bardic Inspiration that we can use outside of our actual flourishes. So we get a 1d10 bonus because we're a level 10 bard now. And of course we have our Inquisitor's Might and our Counter Charm. So all this kind of comes together so well in a really strong character that can do damn near anything in the game. And I've shown you a great weapon version. This could be a dual wielder, a sword and a board, and so on and so forth. Let's talk a little bit now about equipment. So when it comes to weapons for this, it's really gonna depend upon you and the character you're playing. Do you want to use a sword and shield? Do you want to use a gray weapon? Do you want to use dual wielding? Just use whatever you find. There is not really a set set of weapons that are going to be super, super amazing good for you. And you, if you don't take them, you're losing. There's the Blood of Lathander, Lathander, which I actually do not have in this playthrough. You can see that right up here. That's going to be a really amazing mace. It's going to help heal you if you get um, downed. You get a level six sunbeam where you get basically do a big Kamehameha shot. And when you get this at the end of level, uh, Act 1 and before you go into Act 2, it's going to help you fight everything in Act 2 because it gives you a light source. Another really strong weapon is the Blade of Avernus or the Everburning Blade, I mean, uh, that you're going to get. On the Nautiloid, you actually have to use Shadowheart to have her command to drop the Cambion General. He'll drop this burning two-handed weapon that you can use throughout the entirety of the game up until the point you get to a better two-handed weapon later in Act 2 or Act 3. It's a really, really good sword that does fire damage and everything. So those two weapons aside, you can pretty much just use anything you come across that makes sense for the character. Um, I'm using the Baldurin Great giant slayer on a hit double the damage from your strength modifier this weapon grants you advantage on attack rolls against large huge or gargantuan creatures and i get a special giant form where i can become even bigger and i get temp hit points or temp hit points and advantage on strength checks i get this cool topple the big folk ability it's a super good sword but you'll get it at the end of the game 
There's other good ones, though, that you get early, like the Susser Great Sword, which you can silence people with. You get the Blackguard or Blackguard Sword, which will on hit infuse with one of your smites. The target must succeed a Constitution saving throw or become dazed. So this has kind of the same benefit of using Inquisitor's Might. Inquisitor's what? Yeah, Inquisitor's Might, but without actually having to use it. So you can actually daze things through this, which is really cool. But even something like the Thalar Aluve, which you'll get in Act 1, right when you go into the Underdark, the melody on this is great. It's basically a, a passive bless to everything around or shriek that does uh, thunder damage to everything around. So it's a real, and it uh, uh, banes them. So it's a really, really great capability and you'll use it for a long portion of the game. You can use this either one-handed or two-handed since it is a versatile weapon. But Sword of Chaos is really good, which you'll get in Act 3. Um, Belm and Handmaiden's Mace, both that you'll get in Act 3 are great dual wielding weapons. And they set your strength all the way up to 18. So if you're if you haven't done anything with your strength, it's a great way to just kind of add a little layer of fun into that. But there are just so many weapons in the game. Just choose one that really works for the character or what you're doing uh, uh, weapon setup, and you'll have a lot of fun. Now, as far as gear goes, there are a lot to a lot of things to choose from. Let's start with helmet. Now, when you start the game off, you'll get the Helmet of Smiting very early in Act 1. When you apply a condition with one of your Smite spells, you gain 10 hit points equal to your Charisma modifier, which at the beginning of the game will be 3. So this just gives you 3 temp hit points. It's a nice one to have. An alternative, though, to that is when you inspire an ally using Bardic Inspiration, they also regain 1 to 6 hit points. Uh, the Cap of Curing you'll get right at the Emerald Grove. Saravox Horn Helm is amazing. Probably the one I'd recommend you go into later in the game. Uh, well, it is because it is later in the game, but the number you need to roll a crit hit while attacking is reduced by one, and the effect can stack. You can't be frightened and cannot be afflicted with other alter uh, emotion-altering conditions, and a plus one to your constitution saving throw, which is going to help you out when maintaining concentration, which is what this hel why this helmet's also pretty good, even if you don't use the temp hit points portion of it. A good weapon or a good helmet you'll get right at the beginning of Act Two is the flawed Helldust helmet. The wielder has a plus two bonus to saving throws against spells. Again, Constitution saving throw. And lastly, we have the Helm of Balderon. The helmet heals you for two points at the beginning of your turn. Plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws. Can't be stunned. Can't be crit hit. It's a great, great, great helmet. It's probably the more paladin-y helmet if you kind of think about it, right? Um, Armor-wise, there's the Armor of Perseverance, which you can buy in Act Three. Uh, you can get. The Rippling Force Mail here gained Force Conduit when taking Slashing, Piercing, or Bludgeoning attacks, uh, which is really awesome. It basically allows you to stack Force Damage onto things. Um, the disadvantage on stealth checks, we don't care about that. But the Armor of Agility is really good if you want to go with Medium Armor. Add your full Dex modifier to your Armor class. Additionally, this Armor does not impose disadvantage on stealth. Whatever. Um, but also, the Adamantine Armor, which you get at in the Grimforge, I would get the, the Heavy Armor. This is just the Medium Armor version, but all incoming damage would be reduced by 2 on that armor, and things are sent reeling for 3 turns rather than 2, and you can't be crit-hitted. Once you get that armor, you're pretty good until Act 3. Uh, there's the Blackguard or Blaggard Armor as played as well. All incoming damage reduced by 1, and advantage on Wisdom saving throws. It's just a cool little piece of armor here. Um, there's also what you'll get in Act 1 which is going to be very good for this build, is the Luminous Armor. When the wearer deals radiant damage, they cause a radiant shockwave. And that radiant shockwave will put radiant orbs on things, and those radiant orbs will reduce things attack roll by one. You'll get that in Act 1 right as you get into the Underdark. You'll use it probably all the way until you get any of these other armors we've talked about. I would probably even maybe even use it over the Adamantine Armor because that radiant shockwave is so strong. It's just medium armor over heavy, so keep that in mind. Um, outside of that, though, um, I'll put this on because it's kind of cool and thematic. Outside of that, we have some gloves. So the gloves of heroism, you'll also get an act one. When you use your channel oath spells, you gain heroism, which is cool. We've talked about heroism before, but you can't be frightened and receive five, 10 pit points per turn. It lasts for 10 turns, which is cool. Strength saving throws plus one. But some other cool ones here are the wondrous gloves. Your armor class is increased by one. In addition, if you have a bardic inspiration, you gain one more use of it. So... Think of that as using your Flourish one more time. So you'll get these right here at the mid to late portion of Act 1, and they'll they'll serve you for quite a little bit. Um, the Luminous Gloves are really good too. When the wearer deals Radiant Damage, which you will be doing, the target receives two turns of Radiant Orb. We talked about this before, but now that if you think about this, uh, the affected entity has minus one to attack rolls for each remaining turn. You send it to make an attack. Oh, interesting. Uh, so what this means is, they'll have a minus two or two attack rolls. And if you have that luminous armor on, that's another minus one to their attack roll. So that's minus three to their attack rolls. It makes it way harder for them to hit. 
Legacy of the Masters, you'll get an Act 3 plus 2 bonus to attack and damage rolls with weapons. You can just hit way more often. If you're going with shields, here's a ton of them. Absolute's Protector is nice because it gives us Fire Shield Chill. Uh, Ketherick Shield is nice for plus 1 bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls. Adamantine Shield is always good. The Shield of Devotion is great. great. Just You gain 1 level, 1 spell slot. Think of that as just a free usage of Smite. And you get Aid, which is just free hit points for you. Into our boots, I've got the Boots of pers Persistence on. You gain Freedom of Movement and Long Shredder. If this, they're just on you. You don't ever have to cast them, which is really cool. These are in Act 3, though, of course. Uh, but some other good ones are Boots of Brilliance, which allows you, to, as a class action, to just simply restore one of your Bardic Inspiration slots. Again, just think of that as restoring a flourish. Uh, you've got the Disintegrating Night Stalkers. You'll get an Act 1 from Near. Can't be enwebbed, entangled, and snared, and you get Misty Step. And you also have Boots of Aid and Comfort. When the wearer heals a target, it gains an additional 3 temp hit points. I put this on a dedicated healer, but I wanted to showcase it here in case you wanted to use some healing capabilities. This gives you some temp hit points from it. For our cloak, we have the Cloak of Elemental Absorption. I just really like this cloak because it allows me just to completely shut down uh, any time a spell is cast at me. But you have the simple Cloak of Protection, Flesh Melter Cloak to do reactive one to four acid damage, or even the Vivacious Cloak that gives you eight temp hit points after casting a spell while in melee. For our jewelry to kind of uh, even us out, you have the Amulet of the Harpers that I'm wearing, which is advantage on wisdom and gives you the shield spell. But probably the better one here would be the Amulet of Greater Health. It just sets our constitution to 23, and we have advantage on constitution saving throws, helping us out with dealing with any kind of concentration bullshit. Uh, Ring of Regeneration is just going to give us 1 to 4 hit points every turn, and the Killer Sweetheart just gives us a guaranteed crit whenever we want it, as long as it's, per, uh, it's once per long rest. But some early ones, you'll get our Crusher's Ring in, from Crusher in the Goblin Camp. Just a free plus 10 to movement. Uh, the Coruscating Ring, that when the wearer deals spell damage with Illuminated by a Light Source, they are inflicting, they also inflict Radiant Orb upon the target for two turns. Just way more of that Radiant Orb action because we're already dealing um, those things. And then this does say spell damage. So you do have to keep that in mind. This would be a spell damage. Um, I think it's actually our only spell damage. Um, I think this counts as spell damage, but I'm not sure. Your smite is not a spell as far as the game is concerned, damage-wise. So it's just another way to get ready in the orb. Ring of Fraction, free action though is good. You ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained as well. Um, but that is your gear here. Let's put everything together and show off some combat. There's actually a couple items I missed I wanted to bring up really quickly here. Um, one of them is if you don't really want to go with the whole sword and board and everything like that, you can go with Duelist Prerogative. While your offhand is empty, so no shield, you score a crit hit while when rolling a 19. Moreover, you get an additional reaction per turn. And on a hit with a melee weapon, you use a reaction to deal additional necrotic damage equal to your proficiency bonus. Then you also have Dueler's Enthusiasm, which is a bonus action. While you're not dual wielding, you can make an additional melee attack with the dueler. This is actually like a really good like min maxi type of weapon that you can get through Act 3 going through a very specific quest. And it does actually do quite a bit of damage because of how all these reactions and everything come back together and around. I do want to bring this up because I feel like definitely people are going to bring it up because it is a very, very good weapon. And two things I did not talk about are your general range weapons. And we're going to show this off in combat here. But range weapons are quite good with this build. Um, they're not going to be like something that you're, that is really going to do tons and tons of damage. But you can do a lot of fun things with them. And I'll show you in, in combat. In an Act 2, you can get the Drake Fire Shortbow, which gives you resistance to both cold and fire damage, which is good. And it also gives you a free cast of haste. So this is a really nice bow that you'll use the majority of the game. Um, but then you can progress to the dead shot. The number you need to roll a crit hit while attacking is reduced by 1. This effect can stack. So what you really need to consider here is stuff like the dead shot. It's not talking about with this weapon. It's saying the number you need to roll a crit hit, period. So the dead shot will work in conjunction here with Saravox helmet in conjunction here with the duelist prerogative. So it allows you to make it so that your um, critical hit will not be 20. It'll be 19 or 18 or 17, depending on how many of these weapons you actually have um, equipped. That is also you have the wielder doubles their proficiency bonus when rolling ranged attacks with this weapon, unless they have a disadvantage, which at the level in which you get this, that's going to be plus four, the wielder doubles their proficiency bonus, now to plus eight. So it's a, a huge bonus, and you're gonna see in just a little bit how ranged attacks can really do a lot for this class. But let's put this all together and have some fun. So with this, 
we're pretty far away. I've used a potion of haste to give me another action here just for the sake of the video. But remember we were talking about those ranged abilities, right? So I could use mobile flourish ranged. Shoot a target with enough force to push it back 20 feet. Afterwards, you can teleport to the target. So we've got our really cool weapon that can pretty much do a lot of damage here, right? Um, but we can go ahead and use this. It's going to shove this target and then I can teleport to wherever that target is. Um, conversely, too, I can use, where is it? Slashing Flourish, so that I attack up to two enemies at once. I can go one, two. I can choose these two targets right here and do a little bit of damage. And it's nice because this is just a nice way to give me some range capabilities with this character without needing to be up close and personal. And the multi-shot itself is very good. You can see it's 2d6 plus 19 plus an additional 1d10. That's a lot of considerable damage from a range ability that, I mean, my main character is a ranger and I don't even think he does that much damage for this. So let me show you how fun this can be. Let's push something. That knocked it over, right? Well, now I can go ahead and use this bonus action to teleport to it. Bomb. It's pretty sick. And since we only use one of our actions to do that, I can then have some fun and go ahead and remember, you can't use smite with ranged attacks, unfortunately, or else that would be real disgusting. So we can go ahead then and use, you know, slashing flourish. Let me make sure all the things are up. I, I didn't check that before we started this. We also just definitely want to make sure you have these that but they ask you on critical hits hits stuff like that that way you don't miss any of the ones that you intended to use um you might want to just maybe do the only the the top level ones whatever what kind of works for you we'll go ahead and oh no we'll, we'll, we'll mess we'll, we'll mess things up and run away um you know hey maybe i want to increase my armor class right now by four keep in mind my character has 19 that's it's nothing too shabby right um well hastened He's, he has 17, really. Um, yes, this is it. Let's do this. Oh, well, I hit someone. I might as well slam them in the face with Divine Smite. So you can see here, if I bring over our, our combat log, um, we used Slashing Flourish. We hit him for 37 damage, and then we turned um, that hit into a Smite and did an additional 28 damage, which is devastating and then too like you know what hey um did i, I thought i would use my bonus action <laughs> i didn't i should have done this so inquisitor's might we can go ahead and further use this and have even more fun or you know what spirit guardians here is going to be real juicy just to layer in even more radiant damage so i will super cast this at a rank six let's do in six to 48 boom let me walk around over here and just just completely fry people with probably one of like the coolest spells in the game and we'll go ahead and jump back to this character's turn let me end the turn we'll come back to here so back into our turn we can still have more fun with this right um we still have inquisitors might up for one more turn so weapon attacks deal an additional four radiant damage here um we have heroism for something i can't remember what it was but it's probably pretty cool and just walking into things is just doing tons of spirit guardian damage right so Let's go ahead too. We can cast some of our spells now. Remember, we can't do anything with concentration because we do have a concentration thing up. But you know what? Hey, uh, another one has taken damage, but still. While this aura lasts, you can restore vitality. So let me just kind of show this off. We'll do one of vitality. And now this is up. And I can use my bonus action right now to heal yourself or a nearby ally for 2 to 12 damage. That's a really nice capability to just kind of have at the drop of a hat, which I really, really like. We can be using counter charm on situations where we see we're maybe fighting Gith are going to charm and frighten us a whole ton. We can take any of the weapon actions from this actual weapon and do stuff if we want. You know, I can go topple the big folk because this is the Baldurian uh, Greatsword or whatever it is. We can use our Thunderous Smites to add a lot of really fun elemental damage into this whole situation here. Um, and Divine Favor can do additional. This will overwrite this, right? The point is here, you have answers for damn near everything. And if you don't have an answer for it, you can just go over here, flourish, melee, add my armor class. Go see if we hit. Oh, you know what? We hit and we did a ton of damage and completely nuked them. Or we come over here and I'll just go ahead and you, you don't need to do it like this. But I mean, actually, we'll use our bonus attack from our great weapon mastery. Oh, we missed, unfortunately. But we still have the remainder bonus action or the remainder of our, our extra attack to just completely 30 to 75. Clam fuck. Boom. 
and a critical hit on that too. So we did 37 slashing damage from the sword, four radiant damage because of that, uh, our Inquisitor's Might, and an additional 57 radiant damage, plus the 20 some radiant damage we did from this uh, uh, spell I have, Spirit Guardians, earlier. So you can see that this really has a lot of fun ways to interact with the game. And you know what, on top of it, you don't like the combat music? Pop into a little bard action, get a little get a little Gidolo L. Johnson going. And I think that this is really a class that can fit you as a newcomer in so many different ways. Do you want to use a two-handed sword? You got it. Dual wield, it's here. A uh, sword and board, done. Finesse weapons, do that here. You want to be able to talk to anyone in any portion of the game? This character can do it. You want to wear heavy armor and look like a badass? You can do that. You want to wear light or medium armor? You can do it here too. You can do everything in the game except for maybe hardcore nuking something down, but even then you'll get magical secrets from a bard and you have a lot of really fun bard abilities that are more psychic damage or CC based, but you do have some damage within them. I just think that this is truly the best thing that you can do for your first run through. Now, if you don't wanna play a melee character, I am working on a pure caster character that will have sorcerer as the base. So if that's something you wanna see, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. That's also another really good starting character that you could use if you wanted to not do any melee at all, but just cast tons and tons of spells. But as always guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Go ahead and let me know in the comments below if there's some things that you really like about when you play sword bar that, you, that I forgot to highlight, or maybe there's certain item combinations that I didn't quite highlight. Like I didn't go really into the like the reverberation items that are really good and some other really kind of cheesier uh, uh, mechanics through other items i kind of just wanted to give you guys the gist of things but as always let me know in the comments below always open to a lot of really good feedback when it comes to building out the character in the way that you guys have liked it but as always thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care